Undertaking academic scholarship and research doesn't have to be about discipline and subject. All academics in the university really should be researching and undertaking scholarship into their own learning and teaching practice. Now this uh, would lead to uh, quality enhancement of the courses they, they are teaching on, as well as a number of other benefits which we can discuss. Um, the forms of scholarship and also research into learning and teaching um, are varied. The scholarship of learning and teaching, or what we call SALT for short, um, take, can take the form of just individual scholarship. Now that's um, an academic attending a conference or, or a workshop or a seminar or indeed just reading academic literature and then using that material that they hear at the conference or read in the journal and using it within their own practice uh, in, uh, to inform their teaching and to help them uh, help their students to learn. So it can be individually focused. It can also be what we call um, institutionally focused uh, so that you uh, use your um, uh, scholarship within the internal realm of the institution you work at, so it's internally focused scholarship. So you may come back from a conference and write a report that your colleagues may see, or you may give a seminar, uh, a lunchtime seminar perhaps in your department, where your colleagues will come and listen to what you've learned at, at an event and question you upon it and so on. So there's that internally focused scholarship, which is the next level up from just using uh, scholarship for your own purposes. Now there are some um, additional uh, uh, uses of scholarship. Uh, there's, there's an external facing um, scholarship that has been defined by, well, at least in the United Kingdom, by the research assessment exercise as scholarship that holds at the pillars of your subject discipline. So that might be, um, that might involve writing an encyclopedia or a dictionary or a glossary uh, of terms within your subject area. It's not research, but it's a publication um, that aids and enhances the scholarship of your subject area. Um, right at the other end of the extreme, from individual uh, scholarship, the other end is, of course, a full-blown research. And research into learning and teaching is what we call pedagogic research, or PEDAR for short. And that can, would be based on using established, uh, or we might be based on established theories, using established methodologies, or in fact uh, developing and innovating with new methodologies and developing new theories and models, um, to gather results uh, from different surveys perhaps of students or perhaps of staff, perhaps of interrogating learning resources and so on, and then seeing that right through, uh, through the analysis of, of those results and publication. So a, um, a solid research uh, uh, exercise um, that would uh, end up in publication. Now within the United Kingdom that type of activity um, undergoes a periodic monitoring or an evaluation uh, that uh, then is used to uh, fund research within the broader sector. And in the United Kingdom we, call, uh, we have been calling those the research assessment exercises or the REEs, um, the last one of which was in 2008. Now in the UK we're, we're changing that slightly for uh, years to come um, and it's been rebranded as the Research Excellence Framework or the REF. So pedagogic research is um, research that can be uh, submitted to these research assessment exercises or the Research Excellence Framework as, as, as it's going to be known in the future in the UK um, alongside any other type of research that you may be undertaking it undertaking as part of your academic role, usually within your subject discipline. So the scholarship of learning and teaching and pedagogic research should be part and parcel of your professional practice as an academic. There are a number of reasons why you might want to undertake SALT and PEDAR. Um, first of all, your institution may include it as a strategic objective in perhaps their learning and teaching strategy or indeed their research strategy. For example, at the University of Wales Newport, um, we have the idea that teaching should be research informed, so that staff are encouraged to undertake research into their teaching and into their students' learning, so that they can enhance what they're doing, they can learn from that and enhance their practice. It may also be contractual that you are obliged to undertake research um, that directly benefits your teaching and directly benefits the student experience. Indeed, uh, other institutions um, have the philosophy of teaching-led research, that research is only permitted 
if it can be demonstrated to directly benefit teaching and be uh, advantageous to the student experience. But you might also want to undertake salt and pedar for your own career development, your own career pathway. Um, because increasingly, the higher promotional levels within higher education, such as readerships, uh, professorships, are being given to specialists in learning and teaching and pedagogic research. The other reason why you may want to undertake uh, scholarship of learning and teaching and, and pedagogic research is because you've come up with a really good teaching um, exercise, um, teaching practice that you really want to tell the world about and you want to disseminate that. So you may want to undertake uh, student focus groups, interviews, questionnaires to understand what makes that teaching practice tick and then analyze that and write it up and disseminate that either through publications or perhaps through conferences and other events like that. But perhaps one of the main reasons for undertaking SALT and PEDAR is because it helps to enhance the quality of learning and teaching. Your teaching as a professional academic and the student's experience in learning that. The types of things which you may want to research in learning and teaching are very varied. Um, on, on one hand, you may want to look at generic issues, perhaps such as assessment um, or student engagement. Or you might want to research, on the other end, uh, specific case studies that your teaching um, brings up and brings to light. Um, or it could be a, a particular teaching practice that you've, you've developed. So anything from those, between, from those extremes, anything in between, can, is, is fair game really for research. Now, how would you actually go about undertaking pedagogic research? Well, you may want to do it individually. It may be something that you've uh, identified yourself and you want to uh, carry that through by yourself to, through to publication. Or you may be interested in working with others in a more collaborative research project about a particular issue. And that's particularly so at the generic end of uh, pedagogic research where you may be looking at a general issue like assessment and how it affects students across a range of disciplines, not just the one you're teaching. In. So um, it could be individual, it could be collaborative. And also you want to ask yourself, do you need funding to undertake your research? Do you have to pay students to entice them in perhaps for student focus groups by providing cakes and tea or, or whatever it might be? Um, or do you need uh, funding to transcribe uh, tapes from dictaphones and so on. So there may be an issue of funding and if so where do you look to ob obtain that funding? And, uh, and within your institutions there will be people you, you could ask perhaps in research offices and so on about ways of obtaining funding for pedagogic research. You might also want to think about where the output for your research will be placed. Whether it'll be an article in a, um, a subject based a magazine or periodical, maybe not peer-reviewed, the next step may be to look at a peer-reviewed journal, perhaps an international journal that publishes um, academic papers in that particular area. And there are many examples from many different publishers who do publish pedagogic research. The other end may be to edit a book and collect a, paper, a series of papers together from yourself, but also perhaps other authors, right up to the other end of being the sole author on an academic research monograph or book. So a number of different output types, which are the, perhaps more traditional um, in the pedagogic research sphere. One of the main issues, though, that academics, with their busy life of teaching, undertaking subject-based research, how to fit in pedagogic research and how to fit in the writing, writing up of that research. So being able to manage your workload to create space and to create time for you to develop your research to write it up, particularly writing it up, because that's, the, that's the, the end of the research project, which requires perhaps the most time thinking, the most peace and quiet, uh, and perhaps the most um, uh, dedicated uh, work time for you to actually put that, put the words down, and to, and to find a publisher for your work. Now, within higher education at the moment, there are lots of different terms going around that try and link research and teaching together. One of the commonest ones is research-informed teaching. Now, research-informed teaching has been defined in the literature in a number of different ways, but commonly it's seen as the systematic inquiry into the learning and teaching process. But I'd like to view that 
in a research informed teaching a bit more broadly than just looking at the learning and teaching process. And indeed, I conceptualise research informed teaching as being the um, interface between research into uh, learning and teaching itself, the pedagogic research, and where it interfaces with um, subject based research. Because the subject based research feeds into teaching in, in providing the curriculum content, whereas the learning and teaching research, the pedagogic research, links in in providing ways in which that material is actually delivered, by, li delivered to the students and learned by them. So really, curriculum content from subject-based research and learning and teaching methods from pedagogic research really should both be there in, in, in terms of providing that research-informed teaching. So the two really overlapping circles of your uh, research um, uh, practice should come together and, and uh, contribute to research informed teaching. Another term that's uh, commonly heard at the moment is that of the research teaching nexus. Now this again is an interface between research and teaching but from the student perspective. So this is how much uh, research content students have within their the, in the curriculum they study but also how much uh, research practice they may do as part of their learning. And some well-established authors, uh, professors uh, Jenkins and Healy, have written a number of different monographs for the Higher Education Academy here in the UK um, that sets out very good examples of, of, of where research and teaching is brought together in the curriculum, uh, both in terms of research content of the curriculum and students actually undertaking research as part of their learning. And quite an elaborative uh, um, model has been put together uh, which you've got access to as part of this course. So there are a number of different ways in which research and teaching have been linked together as research informed teaching and in terms of the research teaching nexus. Now they don't mean the same thing and the whole um, relationship between, re between research and, and teaching has become quite a complex and indeed I've, I've put forward a model um, entitled the research teaching complex which places research informed teaching as being derived from pedagogic research into teaching methods and learning methods um, and curriculum research um, as to inform the content of teaching but also then the research teaching nexus sits below that um, uh, from the student point of view of how research and teaching actually come together in the classroom as far as learning is concerned for them. Now at different levels within the curriculum um, perhaps first year undergraduate, second year undergraduate and third year undergraduate, you may expect to find um, different amounts of research being brought into the curriculum at those different levels, up until PhD where of course it will be entirely research based. So first year undergraduate may only have minimal research content and so that will be down at the bottom of what I'm calling the research content con continuum, Okay, very little research. But as you go up towards PhD through masters and honours level undergraduates, um, you come up to the other end of that research content con continuum, whereby practically it's 99% uh, research based. So we have a research teaching complex within which research informed teaching and the research teaching nexus sit, and the research teaching nexus slides up and down this research content continuum. Developing your professional practice in SALT and PEDAR can become much easier and more enjoyable if you become a member of a community of practice in this area. Now, there are many examples of communities of academics that get together to help one another and to, to foster the scholarship of learning and teaching and pedagogic research across the world. In the United Kingdom, we have the Higher Education Academy, or the HEA, uh, which is a, um, an organisation to which you can become a fellow through application, it has 24 subject centres in which it encourages and fosters uh, pedagogic development uh, within specific subject areas, which many academics find very useful becoming associated with those. We also have in the United Kingdom, and indeed this is open uh, to people right across the, right across the world, uh, for those perhaps more interested in pedagogic research at the hard end of the scale rather than scholarship of learning and teaching, um, and that's a society for research in higher education and they hold annual, an annual conference um, which is very well attended from scholars across the globe 
And that's a useful um, uh, organization to become involved with because they have a number of academic journals that focus on uh, research in higher education and learning and teaching. On the international scene, uh, there is the International Society for the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning, ISOTL. And that's a useful um, organization to, be, to become involved with. It's relatively inexpensive compared to the Society for Research in Higher Education. It has an online journal which people, uh, academics can publish in, um, and it also holds international conferences. For example, if this year it's in the United States, next year it'll be held in the United Kingdom, so it does move around the world and gives an opportunity for academics from various parts of the world to actually come together as a community of practice from time to time. Communities of practice don't always have to be external organisations though. You can, you can establish your own community of practice within your institution. Indeed, at the University of Wales Newport, we have created the Centre for Excellence in Learning and Teaching, of which I'm the director. Uh, we, we call it CELT. And that has developed a number of different research programmes in learning and teaching, which encourage staff to come together to undertake collaborative research within particular um, fields. We also publish our own journal, we organise an annual learning and teaching conference, and publish the proceedings from that. So we encourage staff to develop uh, research in learning and teaching and help them disseminate it. So communities of practice don't have to be external organisations, they can be internal like the Celt is here at the University of Wales Newport.